Welcome back to the CCNA Cisco NetAcad Introduction to Networks lecture series. If you are interested in previous lectures, I will leave a link in the description for the playlist. Today, we will be focusing on module number 16, which is Network Security Fundamentals. In this lecture, we will learn how we can configure switches and routers with device hardening features to enhance security. We will cover security threats and vulnerabilities, network attacks, network attack mitigation, and device security. Security threats and vulnerabilities. Types of threats. Attacks on a network can be devastating and can result in a loss of time and money due to damage or theft of important information or assets. Intruders can gain access to a network through software vulnerabilities, hardware attacks, or through guessing someone's username and password. Intruders who gain access by modifying software or exploiting software vulnerabilities are called threat actors. After the threat actor gain access to the network, four types of threats may rise. They include information theft, data loss and manipulation, identity theft, and disruption of services. So if we look at the information theft, information theft is breaking into a computer to obtain confidential information, such as, for example, social insurance numbers uh, with government systems, for example. Information can be used or uh, sold for various purposes. Stealing an organization's proprietary information, for example, such as patent license information that can be then sold to another company or can be used to develop the same product uh, by a, a different entity. So that's what defined as this information theft. Data loss and manipulation. Data loss and manipulation is breaking into a computer to destroy or alter data records. An example of data loss is a threat actor sending a virus that reformats a computer hard drive, for example. An example of data manipulation is breaking into a record uh, system to change information such as a piece of an item, sorry, price of an item. <clears throat> so uh, another good example of a, of this is if you break into your school network to change your grade for example that is considered as a data loss or manipulation type of manipulation or breaking into a system instead of destroying the entire hard drive uh, by reformatting it you are destroying a specific piece of information that you don't want somebody to have for example identity theft Identity theft is a form of information theft where personal information is stolen for the purpose of taking over someone's identity. Using this information, a threat actor can obtain legal documents, apply for credit, and make unauthorized online purchases. Identity theft is a growing problem costing billions of dollars every year, and there are millions of families suffer due to identity theft. And one of the major problem with identity theft is that it's not only just impacting corporations and bad, major companies, the, the identity theft also have a very direct, very strong direct impact on all of us. Everybody can be affected by identity theft. Disruption of services. Disruption of services is a prevention of legitimate users from accessing services to which they are entitled to. An example of this should be DDoS attacks, which are like a di distributed denial of service attacks on servers, network devices, or network communication links. Uh, there are other types of uh, disruptive uh, disruption of services as well, so, such as it could be a, a program that would keep closing certain ports. I have seen that on my uh, home servers. There are some <coughs> viruses and programs that can uh, be used to manipulate the port availability of a server, for example. Uh, that would also cause a disruption of service. So the well-known uh, example would be the DDoS attacks uh, where 
the attacker would attack a specific server or network device to break uh, access to the communication by other uh, users. Types of vulnerabilities. Vulnerability is the degree of weakness in a network or device. This is a very important definition that you should remember for your CCNA and CCNP exams. The definition of vulnerability of a network or system is the, the degree of weakness in a network or device. Some degree of vulnerability is inherent in routers, switches, desktop, servers, and even security devices. Typically, the network devices under attack are endpoints, such as servers and desktop computers. However, uh, the, uh, the hacker or the, the threat actor could attack any devices in between. There are three primary vulnerabilities or weaknesses. They are technological configuration sec and security policy. Technological vulnerabilities might include TCP IP protocol weaknesses, operating system weaknesses, network equipment weaknesses, etc. Configuration vulnerabilities might include unsecured user accounts, system accounts with easily guessable passwords, misconfigured internet services, unsecured default settings, misconfigured network equipment, etc. etc. Security policy vulnerabilities might include lack of a written security policy, politics, lack of un authenticated um, continuity. Uh, what that means is basically uh, you may be authenticating into a system, but the system may be transferring that data to another remote system that may not have the same uh, SSL certificate and security attached to it. So even though uh, you are using proper authentication, that authentication in the next authentication between you and the next device is not. So that there is a break in authentication continuity. Uh, logical access controls are not applied, software and hardware installation and changes not uh, following policies. For example, if somebody just walk into your office and plug in a random device they bought from home and that could cause a issue, a security issue on your network because that device doesn't have the, the proper, um, you know, the policies installed uh, for that kind of hardware installation and uh, non-existent disaster recovery plan. That's another um, issue. So if you have a security vulnerability that created a major issue on your network or data and you don't have a data backup offsite uh, away from your network or separated from your network, then basically that's another problem with your security uh, vulnerabilities. All three of these sources of vulnerabilities can leave a network or device open to various attacks, including malicious code attacks and network attacks. For your exams, you should be able to know the differences of technological configuration and security policies. They are very easy. Just remember what they actually means. So let's look at the technological vulnerabilities uh, in terms of like a, and like, like a basic overview. So for example, TCP IP protocol weaknesses uh, are um, un unsecured protocols. For example, on my website, sanuja.com, about five years ago, used to be HTTP sanuja.com. But now it's HTTPS, which is a SSL TLS certificate. It's actually a TLS certificate. So hypertext transfer protocol, the file transfer protocol, and the internet message protocol, they all have insecurities. So simple network management protocol, SNMP, and simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, um, related to, uh, sorry, uh, you know, related to the, you know, insecurities that are associated with the TCP, right? So there are some mitigations for this. For example, instead of using HTTP to access the website, a website can use the HTTPS, uh, the port 443, which is much more secure than port 80 with the HTTP. Another vulnerability, uh, technological vulnerability would be the operating uh, system weaknesses. Each operating system has security problems that must be addressed. 
Unix, Linux, uh, you know, the Mac OS, Mac OS, uh, Windows uh, Server, Windows Desktop Clients, they all have some security vulnerabilities that are documented uh, in the Computer Emergency Response Team, CERT. Uh, archives can be found on the CERT.org website. There are some vulnerabilities documented there. Um, this is one of the reasons why your Mac OS or Windows 10 computer would receive uh, security patches and security updates uh, every uh, so often uh, because these companies are trying to keep up these operating system manufacturers and designers and programmers are trying to keep up uh, with fixing these technological vulnerabilities with the operating system. Network equipment weaknesses. So there are various types of network equipment such as routers, firewalls, switches, they have security weaknesses associated uh, with uh, their own configurations as well as the designs. Uh, their weaknesses include password protection, lack of authentication, router protocols, firewall holes, and many, many, many more. Um, another example of a network equipment weakness would be that if you have multiple network vendors and devices, so Cisco, D-Link, uh, uh, IBM, whole bunch of network switches and routers everywhere, and if your network administrators and uh, IT technicians don't know how to work with th those kind of different devices, they might misconfigure something due to lack of knowledge. So that will result in, you know, uh, network equipment weaknesses. So imagine you are a Cisco expert, but you suddenly have an IBM uh, router or switch or something like that. Then, well, you should be either learn how to do that properly or get someone who can make sure that it is properly installed. So that's an example that I have seen, uh, uh, you know, in the field where, you know, security uh, issues with the network equipment. Configuration vulnerabilities. So the configuration vulnerabilities are like how you configure those devices, right, in your network. So there could be unsecured user accounts where user account information may not be transmitted using uh, encryption, uh, exposing the username and password to threat actors, system accounts with easily guessable password. Like if you have your username as admin and your password is Canada 2020 or something like that, that's an easily guessable password. I mean, it's okay for a temporarily short term, like a quick password for like a reset something, but it is not good to have it there, right? And I also have seen some uh, wireless access points uh, in major companies and even uh, malls and uh, you know like uh, restaurants where the the admin password is username at root or admin and the password is admin which is basically the default password so that is a horrible thing to do so make sure that those passwords are properly secured with a very strong password and if we, if it is possible change those root and admin users or something else Misconfigured internet services. Turning on JavaScript in web browsers enable attacks by the way of JavaScript control by threat actors when accessing untrusted sites. And uh, this is an interesting point because this type of JavaScript injection and JavaScript control um, attacks were actually used by even government agencies to gather information about uh, criminals or bad guys. So criminal would visit the government website and the government will, can use that JavaScript file to actually to do good. So it's not just used like, you know, but the threat actors use this JavaScript, but it's also good guys like white hacked hackers, like the governments who try to secure internet from like internet fraud and stuff like that. They also use JavaScript. By disabling JavaScript on your web browser may have an impact on some of the um, user experience on some website, but it will increase your security. Other potential sources of weaknesses include the misconfiguration of terminal services such as FTP or web services. You know, having a port 80 open when your entire website is on port 443 makes no sense to me unless there is a reason for port 80 to be open. Or you haven't updated your Microsoft Internet Information Services, IIS, or Apache HTTP server that would also could create a issue with the um, your system because older versions may have misconfigured um, 
stuff in there that you can reconfigure on a newer version, for example. That's another thing I see that a lot of people miss. Like, it's not just misconfiguration of the system you have, but not updating your system to the newest configuration is also a, a issue. Another one would be unsecured default settings within uh, products, as I mentioned before, leaving admin, admin as a username and password, misconfigured network equipment, Again, misconfiguration on equipment itself can cause significant security problems. For example, uh, having the router protocols, SNMP, things like that enabled with security holes in it, or having your management IP addresses uh, and management IP um, uh, management ports completely open to the uh, uh, you know public facing networks of a Cisco device could also can cause uh, some issues with uh, security. Policy vulnerabilities. So the policy vulnerabilities mostly has to do with how management and uh, the IT professionals handle the company's network systems and IT systems. So they could include lack of written security policies, internal or external politics because of different people have different ideas of in your company or an organization, the lack of authentication uh, continuity, rarely poorly chosen, chosen, easily cracked default passwords, or uh, as I mentioned before, you and the service that you try to reach may have a secure connection, but the service itself, the server that holding that service may be communicating to a remote service with unsecured uh, line so it doesn't matter you have the authentication and security done on your part it, the, the server is basically leaking everything to the internet right so that's an example of a authentication continuity issues logical access controls not applied such as inadequate monitoring auditing uh, you know not auditing your system uh, you know this could result in sometimes legal action or termination against IT technicians IT management or even company leadership if uh, if there is a huge leak of um, data because there is no logical access control uh, that could be a huge problem a headache for your organization software and hardware installation and changes that do not follow particular policies as i mentioned before if somebody bring a device in from home and just plug it into the network with no security checks are done that is really bad so that's another one. And the other one is a disaster recovery plan. As I mentioned before, you have to have some form of a disaster recovery plan that allows, you know, uh, not only a, uh, you know, recover from natural and other disasters, but also threat actors. So let's look at the physical security. So if network resources can be physically compromised, that means I basically walk into a, a server room with no uh, security at all, a threat actor can uh, deny the use of the network resources. So this is why companies like Microsoft and Google and everybody have like armed guards on their server farms. This is exactly the same reason governments does the same thing as well. The four classes of physical threats, um, hardware threats, environmental threats, electrical threats, and maintenance uh, threats. Hardware threats include physical damage to servers, routers, switches, cable implant, and workstations. Environment threats include temperature extremes, too hot, too cold, humidity extreme, too wet, too dry. Or you're putting a server room in a basement that always get floods. That does happen in Calgary, by the way. I'm not going to mention the name but one of the major organizations in Calgary put their server room in the basement and in a, an area where we have a lot of floods in Calgary. And then <laughs> during one of the major floods, their entire server rooms got flooded, costing millions of millions of dollars. Finally, they moved the server room to like the fourth or fifth floor. So the new server room will not get flooded. Electrical threats, this include voltage spikes, insufficient uh, voltage supply, uh, which are brownouts, uh, unconditioned powers, which is caused by noise, like the sine wave noises, for example, and total power losses. Uh, maintenance threats, this includes poor handling of key electrical components, um, electrostatic discharge, for example, uh, lack of critical uh, spare parts. Uh, if you are running a server room, you should have like uh, additional extra PSUs, 
power supply units, uh, RAM, etc., etc., hard drives uh, on hand in case something goes out. Let's say an Intel network card goes out, you should be able to have spare parts right away where you can replace that network card so there's less downtime. Poor cabling and poor uh, labeling also another problem. You have a whole bunch of wires going down uh, your network structures. And if you don't know how to, to tell one wire from the other uh, because you did a poor job in labeling, that's going to create more time for the uh, wasted on your side when maintenance issues comes up. Also, it could re result in, uh, you know, you basically cutting into a wire that you should not have. A good plan for physical security must be created and implemented to address these issues. So... Lock up equipment and prevent unauthorized access from door, ceiling, raised floors, windows, ducts, and vents. Monitoring and control closet entry with electronic logs is a really good another option. And use security cameras wherever it's possible. Network attacks. Types of malware. Malware is short for malicious software. It is code or software specifically designed to damage, disrupt, steal, or inflict bad or illegitimate, illegitimate action on data, host, or networks. The following are types of malware malicious code attacks. So one of them is viruses. What viruses does is um, a computer virus is a uh, like a type of malware that propagates by inserting a copy of itself into and becoming part of another program and it's spread from one computer to another leaving infections as it travels. So that's the the fundamental definition of a virus for at least for this class. So in most classes it should be the same. So the definition of a virus is a computer it is a type of malware that propagates by inserting a copy of itself into and becoming part of another program. It spreads from one computer to another, leaving infections as infection infections as it travels. Almost all viruses are attached to an executable file, which means the virus may exist on a system but will not be able to be spread it until the user runs or opens the malicious host file or program. So user has to execute that executable file. Viruses spread when the software or document they are attached to is transferred from one computer to another using the network, a disk, file sharing, or infected email attachments. So remember you understand exactly what viruses are because reason for that is next we're going to talk about things like worms and you might get confusion confusion between viruses worms and torsions and etc etc so make sure that you understand this part so another one uh, would be the worms uh, so they include computer worms that are similar to viruses in that they replicate functional copies of themselves and can cause the same type of damage However, in contrast to viruses, which require the spreading of an infected, infected host file, worms are standalone software that do not require a host program or human help to propagate. A worm does not need to attach to a program to infect a host and enter a computer through a vulnerability in the system. Worms take advantage of system features to travel through the network unaided. So what that means is basically, this is a very key uh, distinguishing factor between a virus and a worm. So the viruses has to be executed and it actually uses the user interaction to do its job, right? But worms, in contrast to viruses, it is a standalone software that do not require a host program or human interaction to propagate. And it uses already uh, you know, uh, uh, already uh, in use system features to travel through a network. So those are key features, differences between. So if you go back to the viruses, it become part of the pro another program and it spread from one computer to another, leaving infections as it travels. And it certainly need to be executed, which means the virus has to be 
uh, that virus file has to spread with the help of humans. But worms are standalone software that do not require a host or program or human help to propagate. And it takes advantage of the system features to travel through a network. Like for example, if you have a port open and using a, a unsecured uh, protocol uh, that can be used by the worms automatically propagate through a network. Another one, uh, another one of those uh, malware would be the torsion horses. And torsion horses uh, include a harmful piece of software that looks legitimate. So it's like a torsion horse, right? But unlike those viruses and worms, torsion horses do not reproduce by infecting other files. They replicate itself. So it's a harmful piece of software, but it looks legitimate. Like for example, you may be thinking you are installing Microsoft Office, but in fact, you downloaded that Microsoft Office copy from some random website, Microsoft Office copy from some random website. And that may ha look like a regular Microsoft Office software, but in fact, it is it has some malicious code written into it. Trojan hoses must spread through user interactions such as opening an email attachment or downloading and running a file from the internet. So Trojan hoses can also be a piece of code that, that is attached to an email as an attachment. Once you download it and run it, it could be, you know, it could be infecting your computer. After it is activated, it can achieve any number of attacks on the host from irritating the users with excessive pop-up ads and stuff like that to damaging the host, which is basically deleting uh, data, stealing your information, activating and spreading other malware such as viruses. So Trojan hosts can be used by viruses to spread its you know, malicious code using the Trojan host as a you know a mechanism to do that. Like for example, you may be you have installed now the this illegal copy of Microsoft Office with the with the malicious software software code in it, and then uh, whoever wrote that code then can use that to steal your data. Whatever you type on your Word, for example, they can have a key logger where they are collecting your passwords, username, social insurance numbers, and etc. Trojan horses are also known to create backdoors to give malicious users access users access to the system so that's that's a, that's a one of the key problems with trojan horses so that software that you are typing uh, you, your information there may be some key loggers they are taking you know backdoors to get your user information using that what you need to remember uh, for your exams uh, is to you need to remember should be able to differentiate between trojan horses worms and viruses and if you are confused about any of these things, like if you don't know how to separate a virus uh, from a worms, if somebody give you a description, you should uh, read this, these slides and make sure you know the differences between all of these three items, like back of your hand, because I guarantee you this will show up on your CCNA and CCNP exams. They can give you a paragraph where you read something that is happening in a system network or some kind of an end device and they will ask you whether it is uh, more likely a torsion horse a virus uh, or uh, it could be a worm so you should be able to be able to separate those things for your exams next we're going to look at the uh, reconnaissance attacks in addition to malicious code attacks it is also possible for networks to fall prey to uh, various network attacks. Network attacks can be classified into three major categories, reconnaissance attacks, access attacks, denial of service attacks. So the reconnaissance attacks, um, the discovery and mapping of systems, services or vulnerabilities. For reconnaissance attacks, external threat actor can use internet tools such as the NS lookup and whose uh, utility to easily determine the IP address space assigned to a given corporation or entity. After the IP address space is determined, a threat actor can then ping the public ava publicly available IP address to identify the address uh, address uh, that uh, addresses that are active. 
this also um, can be uh, you know some people target uh, specific companies because they want to you know figure out uh, all the vulnerabilities of those ip addresses that those companies are using so that's a reconnaissance attack access attacks are the unauthorized manipulation of data system access or user privileges so basically a threat actor will get unauthorized access to your uh, system and then use it to do data manipulation denial of service or uh, sometimes uh, distributed denial of service D uh, ddos uh, the uh, is a method of disabling or corruption of network systems or services by using uh, a botnet uh, which is a uh, that will you know keep pinging or keep trying to accessing one single port of your network or one single service of your network hence uh, preventing authorized users from accessing that system so a botnet is a uh, number of internet connected uh, devices uh, each of which is running one or more bots and those botnets can be used to perform something what I mentioned before called the distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks, uh, steal data, send spam and allow the attacker to access the device and its connections. So these are like three um, type major categories uh, of networks attacks. So let's look at the access attacks. Access attacks exploit known vulnerabilities in authentication services such as FTP services and web services to gain entry to web accounts, confidential databases or other sensitive information. Access attacks can be classified into four types. Those are password attacks, trust exploitation, port redirection and man in the middle attacks. Password attacks are basically implemented using brute force, sometimes Trojan horse and uh, packet sniffers. So brute force is basically they keep guess, trying to guess the password or username or both of a system by keep sending those uh, multiple uh, dictionaries that has those key phrases and passwords and keep attacking the system until it figure out the correct password and username. And then uh, Trojan Horse is, as I mentioned before, I described what it is. So it looks like a legitimate program, but it is actually gathering password and username information. And packet sniffers is basically the sniffing or looking at the packets of your network as it goes through the system. And uh, the threat actor then can use that information uh, to figure out uh, how to access your system unauthorized, uh, in unauthorized ways. Uh, trust exploitation, uh, a threat actor uses unauthorized privileges to gain access to a system, possibly comprom compromising the target. Port redirection, a uh, threat actor uses a compromised system as a base for attacks against another, other targets. An example of this would be a threat actor using SSH port number 22 to connect to a compromised host A, and then the host A is trusted by host B because host B think host A has a secure connection and therefore the threat actor can then use the telnet port 23 to access the host B because host B just trusts host A because it's believed that it is secured. Man in the middle attack which is a very common attack nowadays and uh, it is a threat actor is uh, positioned in between two legitimate entities in order to read or modify the data that passes between two parties. So you could be accessing your banking information, but you may be using a VPN tunnel thinking it is secure. But in fact, the someone in the middle in the VPN connection is actually gathering your data because your bank and you don't now now don't have a direct connection, for example. And next, uh, we will look at how the man in the middle attack works. Uh, so the man in the middle attack, how it works is the step one. When a vic victim requests a web page, as I mentioned, the request is directed to a threat actor like a computer, we could call them a hacker. Or step two, the threat actor computer receives the request and re uh, retrieve the real page uh, from a legitimate website, like a banking website. The threat actor then changes the legitimate web page and make changes to the data. And the threat actor forwards that request page to the victim. 
and the victim thinking that it is accessing the real banking website but in fact in the man in the middle attack there is someone in the middle the bad guy the threat actor that are reading both information coming from your bank as well as the information that you are sending to the bank so that's a man in the middle attack uh, explanation denial of service attacks denial of service attack or dos attacks are the most publicized form of attack and among the most difficult to eliminate these type of attacks had happened almost everywhere in the world and sometimes you see it on bbc cbc news services however because of their ease of implementation and potentially significant damage dos attacks deserve special attention from security administrators so while it is very difficult to eliminate dos or ddos attacks because it is such an one of the e, you know ease of implementation type like very easy to implement and then some some bad guy can easily use ddos attacks or dos attacks as security administrators we need to pay a lot more attention to this type of attack dos attacks take many forms ultimately they prevent un, uh, the ultimately it prevents the authorized people from using a service by consuming system resources and to help prevent uh, dos attacks it is important to stay up to date with the latest security updates for operating systems applications as well as devices such as cisco routers and switches dos attacks are a major risk because they interrupt communication and cause significant loss of time and money because your legitimate authorized users don't have access to the data because of the the dos attacks an example would be let's say a, a hospital with the hospital records well if the doctor can access because of the dos attack that's not only time and money but it could actually a threat to life so these attacks are relatively simple to conduct even by an unskilled threat actor a ddos uh, uses the botnet which is similar to a dos attack but it originates from multiple coordinator sources uh, and for ex- uh, for example a threat actor may build a network of infected host all over the world or all over your network known as uh, zombies and a network of zombies is called a botnet so having all those infected machines together are known as a botnet and then the threat actor uses a command and control cnc program to instruct the botnet of uh, zombies uh, zombies to carry out a ddos attack so this is a, also a very common problem uh, you probably heard that on the news about ddos attacks so the threat actor doesn't have to have all of these devices to attack your network they the threat actor can basically infect whole bunch of devices all over the world or within your network and then use those devices which owned by other people to coordinately attack one single point in your network infrastructure there's a lab called research network security if you have access to your cisco netacad please go ahead download that lab and do it right now and but if you do not have access to this particular lab i will try to find a copy of it and post it on my website so you can do it network attack mitigations the defense in depth approach To mitigate network attacks you must first secure devices including routers switches servers and host most organizations employ a defense in depth approach also known as the layered approach to security this requires a combination of networking devices and services working in tandem several security devices and services are implemented to protect an organization's users assets against TCP IP threats includes VPN tunneling, ASA firewall, IPS, ESA, WSA and AAA servers. And I will go over uh, these things on my next slide. So in the defense in depth approach, uh so VPN is a router uh, that is used to provide 
secure VPN services to corporate sites and remote access support for remote users using secure encrypted tunnels. Uh, during COVID-19, a lot of companies, schools, and institutions and organizations have uh, multiple um, users uh, accessing sensitive data from their office, uh, sorry, from their home, uh, but the data is located in the office, right? So they, most of you probably came across the VPN tunnels because of this, and it is a way of securing access. A safe firewall is a dedicated device that provides stateful firewall services. It ensures that the internal traffic can go out and come back, but external traffic cannot initiate connections to inside host. So basically, you're putting a firewall on your network and making sure that it doesn't, you know, um, it, it doesn't let threat actors access the ins internal networks from outside. The next one would be the IPS, which is known as the Intrusion Prevention System, uh, which monitors incoming and uh, on outgoing traffic, looking for malware, network attacks, signatures, and other uh, fingerprints. If it recognizes a threat, it can immediately stop it or like, you know, it can act on it. So that's what the intrusion prevention system does. There's another one called uh, IDS, which is the intrusion detection system uh, that also uh, can, you know, be implemented on a network security, even though it's not listed here. And ESA and WSA, uh, the which are the email uh, security appliances, uh, which filter spam, malicious emails, and web security appliances, WSA, are filters known as the suspicious internet malware sites filtering. So if you have a corporate email address and you get an email and it says it is quarantined, like Microsoft Office 365 uh, Outlook um, uh, email system does have that, uh, that is basically using an ESA. AAA server, uh, this server contains a secure database of who is authorized to access and manage network devices. So the network devices authenticate administrative users using a database instead of using local username and passwords. So you can have multiple uh, Cisco routers, switches and devices within your network and a AAA server will be containing the access control information, usernames and passwords, including administrative username and password for those devices. So all your network technicians and engineers has to authenticate through that AAA server. Keep backups. Backing up device configurations and data is one of the most effective ways of protecting against data loss. Backups should be performed on a regular basis as identified in the security policy. Data backups are usually stored off-site to protect the backup media if anything happens to the main facility. And remember, your company has to have a proper security policy that will clearly define how those backups will be maintained and how often those backups has to be done. So the table shows the backup considerations when you are writing those policies. You had to think about the uh, frequency, storage, security, and validation. So the frequency is how often you're gonna perform that backup, right? The, so the perform backups on regular basis to as identified in the policy that you have in your company. So if your company says every two weeks, we're gonna back up our, all our systems, you should do every two weeks. If it's every week, you, have, you should have it done every week. A full backups can be time consuming, therefore perform monthly or weekly backups with frequent partial backups of change file is a really good option. Storage, always validate the backups to ensure that the backup file is uh, you know good because if you have a corrupted backup file, when something really bad happened on your real world, you can't, you know, real world, you know, functioning network, you can't use the corrupt backup file to restore, right? So storage is important. And the security of those backups are really important as well. So if you put it, the backup on an offsite or backup on a device that is weak uh, in security, well, you put your entire network at risk now, because basically, even though your uh, current network is highly secured, your backup files that containing all the sensitive information are not secured. So that's not good if the security is bad for those files. 
and then the finally the validation the backup should be protected uh, using strong passwords and the password is required to re restore those backups so that people don't randomly restore random backups onto your backup files onto your system upgrade update and patch as new malware is released enterprises need to keep current with latest versions of antivirus software the most effective way to mitigate a worm attack is to download security updates from operating system vendor and patch all vulnerabilities of the system one solution to the management of critical security patches is to make sure all end systems automatically download updates so on a windows machine you can go to windows updates and you can download the windows update uh, from your home computer by going into settings and windows updates on a corporate network uh, windows servers are often used to push those windows updates on time and get installed when the users are not active that's why some companies will tell you to not to shut down your computer overnight because they are running some of those updates using the microsoft adds and domain policies which we will will not which we will not cover in this particular module or lecture series but i will cover in my uh, server related lecture series authentication authorization and accounting authentication authorization and accounting or triple a network security services provide the primary framework to set up access control on network devices as i mentioned before having a triple a server to get all that information is better than having it on your own device on your cisco switch or router a triple a is a way to control who is permitted to access the network in terms of authentication what actions they perform while they are accessing the network what they are authorized to do with their net uh, authentic authenticated uh, user account and making a record of what is what was done while uh, they are there uh, while they were having that access the concept of triple a is similar to the use of a credit card the credit card identify who can use it how much that user can spend which is the credit card limit and keeps account of what items the user spend uh, uh, in that money on right with the credit card um, statements so what that basically means is imagine you have uh, two administrative accounts for a cisco switch or a router you can have one of those administrative to account uh, to access all the data all the information on the system can change anything they like but the other administrative account may have restricted access and only can access a particular part of the net uh, the uh, cisco device so that basically mean the authorization part so the authentication part is both users are allowed to access the uh, device but one user can access anything in the device the other user only can be used part of it that's the authorization part then the accounting part is all the changes this these users are doing on that cisco or uh, windows or whatever the device get logged saying this user has changed that that user changed that that's what where the accounting part come into play so you can lo look at that as like a credit card as i mentioned here and it does the exactly the same thing i mean it, it does a similar thing as uh, using a credit card firewalls network firewalls reside between two or more networks control the traffic between them and prevent unauthorized access a firewall could allow outside users control access to specific services for example servers accessible to outside users are usually located on a special network referred to as the demilitarized zone or dmc the dmc enables a network administrator to apply specific policies for hosts connected to the network so those are firewalls could be cisco firewalls or palo alto firewalls and the firewall would sit between the internet and your internal network and it will basically t do type of filtering of that internet connections and make sure only the authorized people can access that inside network and 
with a demilitarized zone or DMC within a firewall, you can basically put your uh, things like HTTP servers with uh, HTTPS and HTTP servers with the your website or some kind of a file server where the internet access is needed. So it, it will be a separate zone uh, from the inside zone. Again, in this class, in this module, in this particular lecture series, you do not need to know in depth of firewalls. You just need to know basic things, which we will discuss in the next um, few sli uh, slides as well. Uh, but in my firewall class that I will be doing uh, in the future on my YouTube channel, I will go into depth of how we can configure these things using various firewalls, including Cisco and Palo Alto. So types of firewalls. Um, firewall products comes uh, packaged in various forms. So these products are different. Uh, they, they, I mean, these products use different techniques for determining what will be permitted or denied across uh, a network. They include the following, the packet filtering, application filtering, URL filtering, and stateful packet inspection. Packet filtering prevents or allow access based on IP or MAC addresses. Application filtering prevents or allow access by specific application type based on port number. URL filtering prevents or allow access to uh, websites based on specific URLs or keywords. And stateful packet inspection or uh, SPI, um, it, what it does is incoming packets must be you know, legitimate responses to a request from an internal host. So unsolicited packets are blocked unless permitted specifically. And ISP can also include the capability of uh, recognizing and filtering out specific type of attacks such as DDoS attacks or DOS attacks. That's one of the thing about stateful packet inspection. Sometimes, for example, ping, ping commands are being blocked using the stateful, stateful packet inspection. And, um, these are like the key four types of, uh, you know, firewall uh, configurations that are mostly used in uh, industries. Endpoint security. An endpoint or host is an individual computer system or device that acts as a network client. Common endpoints are laptops, desktops, servers, smartphones, and tablets. Securing endpoint devices is one of the most challenging jobs of a network administrator because it involves human nature because humans are interacting with those desktops and smartphone smartphones and tablets you know it create a complexity a company must have well documented policies in place and employees must be aware of these rules employees need to be trained on proper use of the network policies often include the use of antivirus software and host intrusion prevention more comprehensive endpoint security solution uh, rely on network access control. So we don't go too much depth into the endpoint security, but in this class, but um, something else that I can add to this, an example of the a device security that I can implement is like, for example, uh, some companies, if you plug in a, an external device, such as a USB key or an external hard drive, it will automatically uh, erase everything on that hard drive because it doesn't want a, a unauthorized external device being connected to that endpoint. So it has a software built into it, a small program written by your administrators that will you know erase anything that get connected externally because the company doesn't want you to have access to that, right? So it, that is a really good example of that. I know a few companies who have that in Calgary, for example, uh, and then it, it has to be a human factor is the, the problem, you know, it, it has to be, be able to mitigate that kind of human factor, you know, human nature, right? Somebody could accidentally put a, a USB key with a virus or a worm in it, and if you have a endpoint security there, it can detect that and make sure that it can take, you know, it can use that action to mitigate it. Device security. Cisco Auto Secure. 
The security settings are set to the default values when a new operating system is installed on a device. In most cases, this level of security is inadequate. For Cisco routers, the Cisco Auto Secure feature can be used to assist securing the system. So in addition to uh, this, there are some simple steps you can take in most operating systems to make sure that your security of the device is better than what it is out of the box. One of the simplest thing you can do is to change the usernames and passwords. As soon as you install that device or ready to install and configuring that device onto a system. Sometimes you cannot change the root uh, user uh, ad or admin user username. In that case, make sure you use a very strong password or restrict some of those administrative privileges on uh, the default admin account. Where the, it is possible to change the root or uh, admin password, make sure you change it to something other than just root or admin, and that will uh, also uh, increase the security along with the complex password. Access to system resources should be restricted to only the individuals that are authorized to use those resources. So if there is no need for everybody in your IT department to have access to the central routers, maybe only the few IT techs and IT network engineers should have access to those. Any unnecessary services and applications should be turned off and uninstalled when possible. So if you have a server and it has, uh, you know, web uh, and other services services are running, and if you don't need some of those services, you should be turning it off. Like for example, if you don't want FTP services on that ser server, don't keep it running and open, just turn it off because it's an unnecessary application, right? Unnecessary need. And on an uh, end device, if you have a software or a program that is no need to be there, you should be uninstalling them. Often devices shipped from the manufacturer have been sitting in a warehouse for a period of time and do not have the most up-to-date patches installed. It is important to update any software and install any security patches prior to implementation. So if you take a Cisco or a Windows or any other computer or a switching or a other networking device, out of the box, before you put it into the network, you should run all the updates, security patches, and make sure it is up to date and good to go. Because the device may not may not have been updated since it is it came out of the uh, you know manufacturing center. Passwords to protect network devices, it is important to use strong password, as I mentioned before. Here are standard guidelines to follow. Uh, they are typically recommended by most computer professionals. So use a password length at least eight characters, preferably 10 no more. Make sure the password is complex. Include a mix of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, symbols, and spaces. Avoid passwords based on repetition, common dictionary words, letter, or uh, number sequences in username and uh, you know relatives or pet names biographical information you know such as birthdays id numbers ancestors names or easily identifiable pieces of information should not be in your passwords uh, deliberately uh, misspell like you know intentionally misspell a password like for example instead of smith using s m y t h would be a good one like it you know put a letter or a number in there and it's another one change passwords often so if a password is unknowingly compromised the window of opportunity for the threat actor to use that password is limited if you keep changing your password every couple of weeks to couple of months for example like in your company probably you there is already a policy that you have to change your lan access which is the your windows network access password every couple of months for uh, example that this is the reason why and do not write passwords down and leave them in obvious places such as a desktop monitors or a sticky notes everywhere that's a really bad idea on cisco routers leading uh, spaces are ignored for passwords but spaces after the first character are not Therefore, one method to create a strong password is to use spacebar and create a, a fair phrase made of many words. This is called a passphrase. 
A fast phrase is often easier to remember than a simple password. It is also longer and harder to guess. Unfortunately, some of the devices that we use today, other than the Cisco routers, don't have this ability. So you can use something like, I live in Canada, for example, <laughs> as a password because you can not put spaces in between. Uh, but Cisco routers have the ability to do that. But uh, if you're going to do that, don't, you know, if you live in Canada, don't use the passphrase as I live in Canada. Maybe use a passphrase like, you know, monkeys are funny or something like that. Something very, not identify your location, for example, right? But the key here I want to, uh, you know, deliver her is here is that it is not always possible to use spaces on password, but it's Cisco routers allow that uh, to happen. Additional password security. There are several steps that can be taken to help secure that the password remains secret on Cisco uh, routers and switches. This includes encrypt all plain text passwords with the service password encryption command. I will go through them in one of my lab uh, lectures where I will be demonstrating these labs, uh, how you can use a service password encryption command. Set a minimum acceptable password length with security password minimum length command. Deter brute force password guessing attacks with the logging block for number of, after number of atoms within the number of uh, time period. And disable an inactive uh, privilege executive mode access after a specific time with the executive timeout command. Uh, you can see these commands being used on the right hand side of your screen uh, right here. Uh, but however, on a uh, on a lab a lab um, you know uh, lab demonstration, I will go over them. One thing, however, I should point out, which Cisco don't actually highlight, is the password. So the the, the service password encryption. While it encrypts the plain text password, the Cisco used the same algorithm for encrypting all those plain text passwords, at least now, as of 2022. That basically means is even with the service password encryption, there are ways to uh, you can decrypt it without even going into, without entering uh, all the usernames and passwords because they use the same algorithm, you can backward do it. So it's not a very high security, it's still better than having just a plain text password. So keep that in mind. So the service password encryption does encrypt your passwords in Cisco devices. However, they use the same algorithm and you can actually read the encrypted password and use backward algorithm to decrypt it if you, you know, if you really want to know what the password of an encrypted Cisco device. So they're not highly secured. You know, they don't use random um, encryption methodology. Another way to secure your device is to enable SSH. So it is possible to configure a Cisco device to support SSH using the following steps. Configure a unique device host name. A device must have a unique host name other than the default. So you can have router, but you can have router one or router room or a router basement or something like that, but you can have just router. Configure the IP domain name. Uh, so configure the IP domain name of the network by using the global configuration mode command IP dash domain name and then you can use IP dash domain name sanuja.com for example. Then generate a key to encrypt SSH traffic. So this is actually using an S a key for uh, securing SSH traffic and the SSH traffic, um, the SSH uh, encrypts the traffic between source and destination. However, to do so, the, a unique authentication key must be generated by using the global configuration command, which is going to be crypto key generate, RSA, general keys module, and then you put the bits in there. The bits module, modulus determines the size of the key and can be configured from 360 bits all the way to 2048 bits. The larger uh, the bit value, the more secure the key going to be. However, larger bit values also take longer to encrypt and decrypt information. So keep that in mind when you do this. And the minimum uh, recommended uh, modulus length is around 1024 bits. 
verify or create a local database entry uh, to, to create a local database entry username uh, you just basically go username and then in the global configuration command authenticate against the local database so use login local command in the configuration uh, in of your cisco device to authenticate the yty um, lines against local database and then enable yty inbound ssh sessions uh, so how to do that what you do is uh, transport input ssh and then you put the telnet or ssh command and um, all of these commands, I, as I mentioned before, I will go through a Cisco lab live demo and I will post it on my YouTube channel. Then you can go ahead and watch that and how you go through these commands. Uh, for now, just remember there is a way to enable SSH on your Cisco devices and this is how you do it. Disable unused services. So Cisco routers and switches start with a list of active services that may or may not be required in your network. Disable any unused services to pre preserve system resources such as G CPU cycles, RAM, and prevent threat actors from exploiting these services. The types of services that are on by default will vary depending on the iOS version of your Cisco device. For example, uh, iOS-XC typically will have only HTTPS and DSCP ports open. You can verify this with the show IP ports command iOS versions prior to iOS XE uh, use the show control plane host open ports command. And uh, if you are looking at a device that is not a Cisco router, uh, let's say a Windows computer, for example, uh, if or a Windows server, for ex another example, is that you know if you have services and uh, programs that are running that doesn't need to be there, you should be getting rid of them. As I mentioned before, like if you have a FTP and HTTP service on a server and you don't need the FTP service, just shut it down and uninstall it or don't use, uh, you know, make sure, make sure it's not running in the background. There is a packet tracer file called configure secure password and SSH. If you have access to Cisco Netacad, as I mentioned before, you should go ahead, download it and do them. I'll try to get hold of those files and post it so that you will get hands-on training. So um, for now, if you have access, just go ahead and do them. There's also a lab called Configure Network Devices with SSH. Again, if you have access to them, please go ahead, download from Cisco Netacad and do them. If you don't, I will try to get hold of it and post it onto my website. So that will bring us to the end of this module. And I will quickly go over what we have learned in this lecture. However, before that, again, there is another packet tracer file called Secure Network Devices that will go over most of the stuff we learn here. If you have access to it, please go ahead and do them. Same goes for the Secure Network Devices Lab. It makes sure that, you know, you can do them because uh, that will help you write the CCNA and CCNP exams. And if we look back at what we have learned in this lecture, we learn after the threat actor gains access to the network, four types of threat may arise that include information theft, lo data loss and manipulation, identity theft, and disruption of services. There are three primary vulnerabilities or weaknesses. There are technological configuration and security policy. There are four classes of physical threats that include hardware, environmental, electrical, and maintenance. Malware is a short for malicious software, and it is a code or software specifically designed to damage, disrupt, steal, or inflict bad or illegitimate action on data, host, or networks. And those include viruses, worms, and torsion horses, and you should know how to uh, differentiate between viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. Network attacks can be classified into three major categories. Re they are reconnaissance, access, and denial of service or DOS attacks. To mitigate network attacks, you must first secure devices, including routers, switches, servers, and host. So most organizations employ a defense in-depth approach to security. This requires a combination of networking devices and services working together.
Several security devices and services are implemented to protect an organization's users and assets against TCP IP threats such as VPN, SAA firewall, IPS, ESA, WSA and AAA servers. You should roughly know what they are and how to define them. Uh, but you don't need to know go into depth of how they can be implemented because that is not part of this introductory course. We also learn infrastructure devices should have backups of configuration files and iOS images on an FTP or similar file server. We learn if the computer on a router hardware fails, the data or configuration should be able to uh, get restored using one of those backup copies. We also learned the most effective way to uh, mitigate a worm attack is to download security updates from the operating system vendor, such as in, if you are using a Windows computer, it would be from Microsoft, and patch all vulnerable uh, systems. To manage critical security patches, uh, you need to make sure all end systems automatically download these updates. So if you are a network administrator and you have multiple Cisco devices, you may be able to use sometimes servers and APIs to access those devices to push those updates. And if you are a Windows administrator, you should be able to push those updates to your Windows end clients using Windows Server, for example. AAA is a way to control who is permitted to access a network architecture, uh, what they can uh, do while they are there, which is authorization, and what actions they perform while accessing those networking devices. So make sure you know uh, what the AAA server does, but also what is the difference between authentication, authorization, and accounting. So authentication means you do have access to the device because you have a username and password that is valid and recognized. Authorization is how much of the data and how much uh, you can do with that user account. So you may not have access to certain areas of the Cisco or a Microsoft device, but you do have access to other areas. That is where the authorization come into play. And the accounting is whatever you do uh, with that user account, username and password that you use to authenticate uh, will be logged. Uh, that is where the auth accounting comes in. So make sure you know those things. That's why I'm repeating that again, because they do show up on your Cisco CCNA as well as the CCNP exams. The network firewalls re uh, reside between two or more networks, control the traffic between them and help prevent unauthorized access. And we learn securing endpoint devices is critical to network security. A company must have well-documented policies in place, which may include the use of antivirus software and host intrusion prevention and more comprehensive endpoint security solution um, depend on the network access control. We also learn Cisco routers. Uh, we have the Cisco auto secure feature which can be used to assist securing the system. Uh, for most uh, uh, operating systems, by default, uh, there is a username and a password and that should be changed immediately when you are installing those devices uh, on networks. And uh, the access to uh, the resources should be restricted to only the individuals that are authorized to use those resources and in any unnecessary uh, services and applications should be turned off and uninstalled when possible, such as, you know, if, if there is no need to have uh, HTTP access, just close the HTTP access and all services and just have the SSH access open. And if you have network technicians who shouldn't be accessing certain devices, only that network administrator should be accessing, you restrict that those people from accessing it. So that's what the, uh, this is about. We also learn, learn to protect network devices. It is important to use strong passwords. A, para, a paraphrase is often easier to remember than a simple password. And we also learn it is also better to use a longer password which, because they are harder to guess. For routers and switches, encrypt all plain text passwords, uh, setting a minimum acceptable password length and deter uh, brute force password guessing attacks and uh, disable uh, any inactive uh, uh, privilege executive mode access uh, and specify the amount of time of like, you know, password resetting as well as the, the access times. 
configure or finally the uh, configure appropriate uh, devices to support ssh and disable unused services so usually when you enable ssh on a device you don't need telnet so i would just get rid of that and just use ssh when if it is available and suitable that would bring us to the end of this lecture if you like these modules and lectures please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel if you have any questions or concerns related to this particular topic or any other topic you are feel free to contact me by leaving a comment below until next time good luck with your exams and have a nice day